Hello, and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental nerds, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Nick and I discuss how men can be more supportive in the workplace. We talk to Shannon Olkers about her work in Alaska, fuel tanks, and science literacy. And finally, we have a very special and finally from our guest. Shannon, take it away. So in Alaska, we have a little bird called a black-capped chickadee. Mm -hmm. And they grow their brains by 30%. They literally add 30% more neurons in preparation for fall. So they can memorize where they hide the seeds through the winter. And then when spring comes and food becomes more available and mating season begins, they shed 30% of their brain cells (laughs) and their brain shrinks up again. Oh my gosh. So you're telling me they they get dumber (laughs) when they're trying... (laughs) To, yeah. to make babies. Wow. That they is literally, impressive. they literally lose 30% of their brain. I think some people do that too. I was going to say, this yeah, explains a, a lot. That's a human thing. Um. <laughs> but the cool thing is that they actually shed the neurons that remembered where the food was. So scientists are now at UAF, University of Alaska Fairbanks. They're now realizing, because they're studying this, like if you could mm-hmm. grow neurons, how cool would that be yeah. for humans, right? Yeah. But what's interesting is they don't lose their memories of nesting and mates and good food sources, but they do lose all of their cash memory. And so they don't remember where they cached food from the previous year. And so it's wow. interesting that they're adding specific neurons just for yeah. finding yeah. food. And then they shed them all when it comes time to, when the food becomes more bountiful. And they think it's a trigger because the birds that have bird feeders, they don't necessarily add the neurons because they don't go through food scarcity. So oh, it's wow. just this fascinating field of study. I It was started when I was an undergraduate at UAF and they've now, you can Google it. It's all over the place, but it's just really, it's a cool, neat fact about these neat little tiny birds. (laughs) Hit that music. Hey everyone, NAAP is still accepting submissions for the their annual conference and training symposium that's going to be in Fort Lauderdale, Florida this year. The conference itself is going to be May 16th through 19th. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of really good speakers there, really, really engaging and interesting sessions as they always are. But we are actually looking for your submittals, your proposals for what we talk about. So please submit your abstracts through November 15th at www.naap.org. It's a great time. I know a lot of you have some great ideas and we'd love to hear about them. Laura and I love doing the show. If you love it too and would like us to keep doing it, we need your help. We can't do it without our awesome sponsors. So please head on over to www.environmentalprofessionalsradio.com and check out our sponsor form for details. Let's get to our segment. I'll just dive right into this question. You know, we talk a lot about like women in the workplace and it can be a challenge. And I hear that a lot from, you know, about how women have to navigate the workplace. What can men do? to be better stewards for those workplace environments. Oh, gosh. I know, it's Um, a really power. Yeah. (laughs) First of all, I think they need to ask that question. Yeah. It's probably the best first thing you can do is just recognize that. And honestly, I think that really is what it boils down to. Recognizing that there are probably things that you don't even realize you're doing. Like Shannon mentioned that she was getting advice about you need to have an office and whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, That might not necessarily only have come from men, but I bet it came from a man. I've been told I needed to have changed my area code number on my phone so that people won't want to work if you're not local. Like I didn't ask you for that advice and (laughs) I'm doing quite fine with the phone number that I have. Thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. But that comes from someone assuming they know better than you or not asking you first. Do you, do you want my advice or how successful are you? But mm-hmm. I think in the workplace, it's mostly important for men to take a step back and be self-aware and just ask that question. And maybe even literally ask that question of the women yeah. you work with, what am I doing? And be open to whatever they might say, you know? And um, I don't know if there's like specific, I mean, there's the obvious things. Don't touch <laughs> don't, <laughs> without, without being invited to touch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I almost died from, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I would like, cause I almost said it goes without saying, but it has to be said because it happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, so not making assumptions that maybe you're in the kind of relationship you think you are with your coworker, you know, just because someone is friendly with you at work, doesn't give you certain permissions or, mm-hmm. um, 
you know, I'm trying to think back to like personal experience, not only personal experience, but what other women have said to me. Yeah. Is it like, um, I saw this once about like, if you wouldn't say it to the rock, don't say it to a woman. (laughs) Is it that kind of thing? Is that? Yeah. Well, I just had a conversation yesterday with a woman who's new to management in her company and it's a big company that you would expect lots of good things from. And she had a meeting request from another manager. So this person is not her boss and was like, oh, we need to have a meeting, blah, 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 blah. And then I think he missed it or was late or something. But anyway, she got sort of reprimanded by him for not putting it on his calendar. You know, like, Hmm. can you put that on my calendar? Why didn't you put that on my calendar or something? And I had to ask her, like, do you think he would have asked a man that same thing? To, mm-hmm. you know, like, Nick, why didn't you put that on my calendar? <laughs> um, my guess is no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, you I'm know, not, yeah, you yeah, have your own calendar. Your job. Yeah. You put something on my calendar. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that to me is the same thing as like, why didn't you bring me my coffee? You know, right. and I think it's just there's a lot of like little things that may not seem harmful or that your man's been you know, on the whole mansplaining thing. Which, you know, maybe you want to explain that. Maybe there are people listening who don't even know that mansplaining is a thing. I know. And I do have to catch myself. Like I said, I love, I love giving people advice. I love talking about things I'm very passionate about. And it took me a long time to realize that sometimes people did not ask me what I'm telling them. And it's really, it can be really harmful if, for example, you're just saying, oh, you don't know this thing. Let me tell you what you should be doing instead of, you know, having a conversation. Because that's really what you should be doing is talking. And there's a back and forth in that. And a lot with, with mansplaining, it's just, am I mansplaining? Mansplaining, actually. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's just, that's exactly what it is. It's like, I'm going to tell you the thing that I know that you obviously don't. And sometimes you can really, really put your foot in your mouth, especially if somebody's an actual expert in the field or if somebody just does not need to hear that like you just you know so you really have to be careful about that kind of thing and i think that's really scary it's something that's really easy to overlook because you're just you think well of course this person wants to hear from my opinion because i'm brilliant and great and wonderful why wouldn't they and it's uh, but then you start thinking about who you're doing that with and why you're doing it and where and that's where it can be, be really problematic if right, it's just women I, you know yeah that's i've been in situations where like a colleague will suddenly or someone I'm just talking to to have a conversation will suddenly put themselves in a position of mentorship. And I'm like, you know, there are cases when that's Mm -hmm. maybe required or if I was, was asking for it, but there are definitely multiple numbers of times where I'm like, I didn't really see you being this person who I was seeking mentorship from, you know, we we are peers. Yeah. Yeah. We're peers. Yeah. Thank you for imparting your knowledge. Um, (laughs) There's also just like other small things like eye contact I've been in interview situations where, you know, interviewing someone for a job. So youngins out there, pay attention. I I have been the person who was going to be their supervisor. And I don't know if it could just be nerves, but I've had people who will just, who would look to my boss, who was a man and ask him questions and look at him and not even make eye contact. It's yes. like, hello, you're going to be working I, for me. You yeah. want to maybe look my direction? And they literally not got hired for it. Mm-hmm. So stuff like that. I had bosses who would tell me to like put my hair a certain way or paint my nails or just like those things may seem harmless, but you really have to keep yourself in check and say, would I say, hey, I like the way your hands look today to another man, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we're laughing, but yes, this is exactly right. It's just the strangest thing. And I'm glad you brought that up too. I thought about this. I actually had, um, there's two things. There have been moments exactly like we talk about where it's a man and a woman and they're only asking me questions. And I'm like, I don't know. What do you think? Other person who knows more than me? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, it's like, I don't want to be that blunt, but sometimes you have to be pretty obvious. I'm like, she's our expert. Ask her. But then like, you know, there's been, I think mentorship's a really important one too. Like there have been companies and situations that I have seen where there's somebody who has HR violations on their record for being inappropriate in the workplace with women. And they're submitting applications for mentorship programs. So that happens. I don't know that it's even happening. Several different women came to me and said, this man cannot be a mentor. And I talked to them and, 
you know, talking to people in leadership and they're like, well, yeah, maybe you can only mentor men. I'm like, incorrect. No. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. <laughs> um, if he can't talk to women, he can't talk to men either because he's going to create an environment where men think it's okay to behave that way. Right. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. You guess I'm right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, yeah, that's one I, I, you just re- yeah. made me think of. It's really hard. And I think that's the keys, right? Self-awareness. Take it seriously. This is not a joke for women, you know, and not even just women, people of color, people who are different than you, minorities, young people. Yeah. You know, you have to be aware of how you're coming across to people and if you're actually listening and then be champions for people and for everyone, not playing favorites with the other people who look like you or whatever, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that's great. And that's another thing. It's always seems so negative when we talk about it. That's such a positive thing. Be a champion for someone else, you know, someone who's different than you, someone who has different life experiences. I love that. Yeah. That's why we have and in the, the that's ultimate we have would be like, step aside. If you're in a company that is homogeneous, step aside for someone else to come up to the table or take a seat or be involved or, you know, like, yeah. well, that is all self-awareness and caring. Right. Caring is very important. <laughs> yeah. You do have to care. And, uh, and I think that is maybe one of the things where the difference between men and women, like men are maybe more business focused and less heart focused and, you know, it takes a little effort. Yeah. And I do, I do think that I honestly think that's changing. I think, our, you know, the, over sure. time, I think empathy has become one of the primary traits for leaders that did not used to exist. 100 percent did not used to be a thing. And I have seen that change. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but you have to care about your employees in order for them to stay. So we talked about with Shannon, right? She genuinely cares about the people that are with her. That's why they're there. That's why they mm-hmm. stay. That's why they like working with her is because and she it's cares. infused into the actual work. It's not a matter of like caring after hours. It's yeah. caring into the policies, into the decisions that you make as a leader. So it's really, I think that's great, wonderful information. I appreciate you answering that question without looking at me like I'm an idiot. I really do appreciate that. I appreciate it. Uh, Cause it makes like me nervous said, to ask. It ask does. the question. You should be yeah. asking more people that question. And I think more men should be caring enough to ask the question mm-hmm. and to really hear the real feedback. Because yeah, feedback is scary. Again, that is scary. You don't yeah. know what it is you may or may not be doing and something, you know, it's all perspective too. something you might do with me in a relationship with one woman might be fine. Something that you do with someone else and their background and their sense of space and self and whatever might be totally different. So it's not enough to just make assumptions or think that what, oh, I was fine behaving this way with Laura. It must be fine for Sally too. You need to make sure that it's okay with Sally. Right, right. Yeah, that's also brilliant advice. So yeah, thank you for that. And uh, you know, like I say, I think we can make this a continuing conversation because, like, you know, it's not not going to go away anytime soon. So, but let's go ahead and get to our segment for now. Yeah, for sure. Welcome back to EPR. Today we have Shannon Olkers, owner and principal consultant with Integrity Environmental and member of the Alaska AEP. Welcome, Shannon. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, so glad you could be here. Hope it's a nice morning there in Alaska. It's very dark right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're super excited. You're our first guest from Alaska or that's located in Alaska. And I also saw that you went to the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. So that makes me wonder if you have always lived in Alaska. I have actually. My family's been here a long time, four generations. So long-term Alaskans. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I was going to ask you what it's like to grow up in Alaska, but now I want to know what it's like being a fourth generation Alaskan. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my great grandfather was a, a gambler and a gold miner, and he won and lost several fortunes. Oh, hey. So we basically didn't inherit anything except the cool legacy. <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, that's so neat. But that's amazing. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's basically two seasons in Alaska when people come to visit and when they go away. There's three. Right? There's there's, three. there's winter, and there's summer, and there's construction. So everything <laughs> happens in a very compressed time frame. <laughs> so a lot of our roads and airports all get fixed within a two or three month window. So what is it like wintering there? So do a lot of people leave? And uh, you know, I, I mean, I picture the shining every time. I, no. <laughs> I like to live in Alaska year round. Well, if you know, there's a whole lot of snow sports, like you can do unlimited cross country skiing and snowshoeing and you probably call it snowmobiling down there, but we call it snow machining. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. You guys probably think of a snow machine as like something that makes snow on the side of a yeah, mountain. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. call it snow machining and you get on your machine and you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, um, I don't know. There's just, I like winter hiking. I just put screws in my hiking boots and go up. There's unending trails and beautiful mountains. And I, I really like being outside. I really like, I like winter cause you're never hot. It's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. That's true. So yeah, I think most people just adapt and get out more. And I mean, you do have to love winter to live here. I think if you didn't love winter, this would be a very hard place to live. Yeah. And there's changes with like um, how much sun you get too, right? Which is pretty yes. stark compared to other mm-hmm. places. So, so what's that like, that shift? Well, I grew up in Fairbanks and it's that's in the middle of the state. And so it's a little more pronounced. I live in, near the largest city, Anchorage now, and that's much more mild we rarely see below zero and the, it is darker in the winter and lighter in the summer, but it's not 24 hours of daylight. Like it is the further North you go. Oof, yeah. But yeah, in the summer, the sun will still be shining at 11 o'clock at night enough that you could mow your lawn if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> It's always the, that's the fun thing where you're like, Oh, I got some time. And you start mowing right. and you realize it's 11 and you're looking at your neighbor's house, hoping they're not mad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 11 PM. Let me start this up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you're also a bit of a history buff in Alaska. I don't know if you know, this has some really <laughs> unique history. So um, what do you love about it? Alaska history and do you have any fun facts to share with us? Sure. Well, I love Alaskan history because the work that we do is with a lot of these industrial facilities, and many of them were initially installed around the turn of the century when mining and logging operations were initiated back in those days. I don't know. I've got, there's so many interesting things. I did a project for the Cordova Electric Association, and they have a hydroelectric dam that's installed on top of one that was installed in 1908. And that 1908 log dam is still there and it was built so well, they tried to dynamite it out to restore the stream that they put the log dam into and they couldn't dynamite it out. And so they ended up cutting a hole through it instead. Wow. And um, it's just fascinating to me. So I'm standing there doing a spill prevention plan for this hydroelectric dam that's very modern. And then behind me is the old wooden trough ways and the old Pelton wheels with like the little cups and they, they rotate and then it drives the energy. And, and in 1910, Cordova had a movie theater and they played movies with reels because they had electricity and like the model T was invented the same year. Like that's, yeah. <laughs> to me that's just fascinating <laughs> wow. that this tiny little town in Alaska had all these things going on. And then I'm <laughs> looking at the remnants of it as I'm doing my modern job. So I, I find that stuff really interesting. Super cool. My goodness. Uh, if you go to our LinkedIn site or my LinkedIn site, there's a photos of that hydroelectric dam and the Pelton wheel and me like running around the woods looking for it <laughs> <laughs> and a better, much better story than I just gave you. But. No, I love it. The indestructible dam. I love that. That's, that's an incredible. Yeah, they try so real hard. A website with some of these facts and things on it. We do. Uh, we have them as blog posts on our company website, which is integrity-env.com. Perfect. Uh, you can also see most of those articles on my personal LinkedIn site as well. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm the one I asked you're the next question. Ask. Yeah, I know. I'm like, that's yeah. why there's a pause. This yeah, that's exactly what I, I just ignored it. I was like, it's, it's the same thing earlier. <laughs> I, I love missing the first thing and going to the second. That's uh, ask my wife. She loves it. So <laughs> what are the most noticeable impacts you've observed? I guess like, we talk a lot about climate change, right? We've heard a lot about that from different people, but the effects of that in Alaska can and will be pretty stark. So what have you observed already environmentally and culturally, and how is that impacting your job? Well, climate change is a tricky subject in the fuels industry, (laughs) of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we do notice that shorelines are changing. We do notice that ice coverage is different than it has been in the past. And for what we do, which is working primarily with industrial areas that are along ports, is that we're seeing faster erosion of port infrastructure and having to replace things sooner than anticipated or protect a marine header or a dock because it's getting beat up because it used to have ice coverage, but now it doesn't. And it's getting Mm -hmm. 365 days a year pounding from water, open water. We're also seeing erosion of lands that were previously filled in to provide space for docks the ocean around where we work is changing and and how that changes. We also are seeing some really interesting wildlife events. A few years ago in Seward, Alaska and South Central, there was a huge mirror die-off 
Mm-hmm. And they basically had a large breeding um, year and then the water warmed up and there was less food for them. And so the very large population then began dying off and they were just skin and feathers really. Um, mm-hmm. And you would just see hundreds of them everywhere. And there's a, a couple different articles you can look those up on. And so there's just sort of like odd things are happening. Yeah. <laughs> and how we, we see it in our industry, but we also see it in infrastructure stabilization, I guess. We have tanks that were built. We have infrastructure that dates from 1914 as one of our oldest tanks, all the way up to tanks that were built this year. Yeah. And how they were constructed in you know 1914, which was just plopping them on the ground versus today, it creates some interesting infrastructure challenges when you're trying to preserve a fill site along a dock that is now having to be changed or modified. It adds to the consulting work that we do about having these tanks meet regulatory requirements and and engineering standards, but also dealing with the realities of what's happening around them in the environment. That's pretty amazing. And I love that you are looking at the the historical aspect of it and really paying attention to that. And it sounds like your business does some really cool work, but I'm interested, especially from a woman's perspective who actually owns businesses as well, because I know my path that led me to starting those endeavors was not a straight one. What was your career path like and how did that lead to you starting your own company? Sure. So I was the kid when she was 12 years old who wanted to be a wolf biologist and was going <laughs> to run that path and be the best wolf biologist on the planet and live in Alaska yeah. and be wonderful. And that did not happen for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I am okay with that. <laughs> and I like to tell, especially other girls that I mentor or that I interact with that when you're 12 or 18 or 24, what you can imagine your career being is pretty limited and you really don't know what can happen. And so I, I really struggled with math. And I also tell people that I mentor all the time that I, it took me three times to get calculus. And I used to be embarrassed about that, but I'm not anymore because who gets it on the first time? You know, like it, it's no big deal as long as you get it right. And so when I struggled with math, that made me less competitive for things. And so I did not, you know, I I graduated from UAF at a time when they were graduating 250 biology students a year. So my chances of getting a job, (laughs) even with a PhD, were pretty limited. And so I was forced to look at other things. And I actually chose a fun job because I love traveling and I loved history and I loved Alaska. So I actually worked for the farthest North Girl Scout Council for four years doing Mm -hmm. uh, adult development and Girl Scouting and Girl Scout camps all over rural Alaska. So Unilakli, Bureau, and it was a wonderful job. I literally got paid to play with kids in the tundra and do (laughs) science-based curriculum. It was the funnest job ever. And that job really taught me rural Alaska, which is a unique environment and communities and many different cultures. And when I was done with the Girl Scouts because I wanted to make more money than I could make at the Girl Scouts. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, you know, starting to grow up. I was in my mid twenties, right? Right. Um, right. I, start, I went to work for the state of Alaska and I originally started in contaminated sites working with rural communities because I had all this background in working with mm-hmm. rural Alaska. And then the group that does terminals and tank farms for large bulk, bulk fuel storage groups, they needed somebody who understood rural Alaska as well, because in Alaska, we have a very fractured power structure Our infrastructure is individual. So each community has its own power source and generation capabilities because they're so far apart, you can't really connect them. And so in the 70s, the state invested heavily in diesel generation. And now we're seeing other energies coming into augment diesel. But most of our communities are very far apart and have large bulk fuel storage tanks that hold diesel enough for a whole year of power generation and heat and all the other things communities need power for. So they brought me in because they needed somebody who knew rural. And then I worked at that job for maybe three or four years. And I became a business owner because I got pregnant and the state would not allow me to do part-time work. And Mm -hmm. I said, well, maybe I'll just stay home with my kid instead. And that lasted nine months. (laughs) (laughs) And And then one of the people that I used to regulate or a company that I used to regulate called me up and said, would you help us? We have a problem. We don't really know what to do. We're not big enough to have a whole environmental management program or team. Could you just help us? And so I started it for my dining room table with my first kid. And then I had a second and then we got a lot of business and I thought, well, I can only do so much. And so I started adding other people and that's how I became a business owner. 
Nice. <laughs> when you, you mentioned starting at home at your kitchen table with your kids, I'm picturing little boss babies. <laughs> <laughs> I I have a very awesome picture of my computer and my kid balanced on the table. And I was like, working mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, that that's fantastic. And I love that all the little pieces just kind of felt, you know, you needed the rural experience that took you to this other thing. And then one of your previous clients reached out to you and it kind of opened the door like, oh, I could do this. And then you just kept going with it. And now you've kind of evolved into a really amazing, or at least what I think is kind of an ahead of the curve business model. So talk a little bit about how that evolved. Yeah. When I first started my business, I had some rules because as you remember, I was a stay-at-home mom before I launched my business. And I wanted to protect that space with my kids. I wanted to be able to meet the school bus if I wanted to. I wanted to be able to go into the classroom and volunteer. And way back when I started the business in 2010, that really wasn't, it was done, but it wasn't mainstream like it is now post COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Like this was, I remember getting all sorts of bad advice. Like you have to have an office or nobody will take (laughs) you seriously, right? Right, yeah. (laughs) You have an office, no one's going to call you. And I'm like, call my cell phone. (laughs) So I'm a really, yeah. I'm a really good open thinker. Like I'm very flexible with my thinking. And so I thought I don't really need to have a cube in an office. And so I kind of had this, let's see how far I can go with it. Right. Like maybe I can, maybe I can, if it, you know, I didn't feel like I had a whole lot to lose in the fact that I was like, well, let's just try it. And if it sucks, I'll go get an office, but I could save (laughs) $20,000 a year in rent if I just was able to do it from home. And so that was what I founded the company on. And when I started adding other people to the group, I wanted to give that same opportunity to everybody else. And one thing that I think most businesses have trouble with, and and I know why, but I, I do think it's not insurmountable is it's very difficult to give women, especially, or or anybody the flexibility to have part-time when your kids are little and then full-time when they go to school. And then maybe part-time again, when they're struggling with all the high school things that teenagers bring to your life. So we have flexibility in the now, like if you need to take 10 hours off this week because your kid made the hockey tournament and you got to go, we're okay with that. But we also have flexibility over time. And so we have some people who are working for us part-time now, but they'll return to full-time once their kids are out of a certain age range. Hmm. And one of those reasons is altruistic. I wanted to make it this awesome job, like the one I wanted, but it's also really beneficial to me as a business owner, because I've got these amazingly niche trained talented environmental managers and I don't lose them. (laughs) Right. And they stay up to date and ready to work because they have part-time work during these periods where they have more family obligations. And so I sort of get, you know, instead of having a person for two years and then they go away for five and then I bring them back on at the same level they were when they left. If I flex with them over their family planning periods, I end up with someone who's got seven years experience and ready to be full-time when they come back. Right. And so to me, that's worth it monetarily wise and, you know, in the feelings too. Um, And so it is a bit of a struggle to manage all of that. And there's an old fashioned term for it called job sharing, where we have some positions where we've got two people in it who are both kind of at the same stage of life with family. And so they can kind of share the job. And I have one full-time equivalent, but two people doing the job. So that's the business model that we've created. And it's been very, very profitable for me because our employees stay, they're fanatically loyal. They love working here. And I work very hard to make sure that they do love working here. And it's made it very easy for us to get top talent because they come to me. Yeah, that's <laughs> they're like, awesome. hey, Shannon, have you thought about right. hiring me for this job? And I'm like, right. well, I have thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. And they're all women. So far, right? yes, they are all women. We are not opposed to men. I get asked that a lot. Oh, you only hire women. (laughs) (laughs) But I do think that some of our flexible modeling and some of the things that make the job appealing to a lot of women are not as appealing to men because they they're looking for the big career, the builders. They want to work for big name recognition. And we're a small boutique firm. We're never going to be the Jacobs of the world. And I, I don't want to be the Jacobs of the world either. So we have not had a guy yet, but I'm waiting. I'm sure we will eventually have somebody who that will find this appealing. Oh, I'm sure. And I mean, I think we mentioned it, right? Post-COVID world. That's yes. So your, your model basically set up how we're going to be doing things in the future, I think. Well, and what's interesting is when COVID hit, it didn't really affect us that much on the office side. It was just traveling to rural Alaska for our site visits. That was the only thing that really stopped us up. But yeah, it was seamless on the office side. We already had everything set up to be secure. 
and networked online. And yeah, that just sort of grew out of us thinking ahead and thinking outside the box. And it served us very well in 2020. I mean, you know, it really is very forward thinking. I know that a lot of people, younger people were clamoring for this all over the place. And most of what I was told, what other people have been told is, well, no, you have to be in an office because it's an office and you have to be there. But what? Yeah. It's not true. I will say one thing though. We do invest in team retreats about every other year so that we can get some face time and sort of get to understand each other on a physical level. And we do use certain tools to help understand personalities that you just can't get because there's no water cooler. So we use like Clifton Strengths Finder, for example, to understand yeah. how people work. I love that tool. It's I love so it. Great. I love it. Yeah. And people look at it initially like it's some weird horoscope thing, but then when you get down <laughs> into the how you work and what makes you feel good about your work, it gives you this whole level of understanding of how or why somebody's doing something that's not just, well, she doesn't like me. <laughs> no, right. she just doesn't right. like this job or the way you're asking her to do it or, yeah. And so even, we do yeah. use those things for the in-person piece, but we're talking a minimal investment over time. I mean, nothing like that rent check every single month that an office for 10 people would cost me. Yeah, exactly. I love that too. It's something we've, Lauren and I have talked about a few times, but it's just like, everybody is so wrapped up in their own brain that. You have to remember that. Like when you're wrapped up, you think, I wonder what they think about me. They're also asking the same question. So it's, it's good. <laughs> yes. It's good to be there. Um, but you also mentioned, so Alaska, again, very unique environment. Uh, fuels yeah. are really important. Like you said, communities are spread very far apart. So you're, you know, a bulk fuel permitting expert. So what kind of projects do you actually work on? And do you have any favorites right now? Sure. So what our firm does is we provide environmental permitting, planning, and inspection services for large industrial groups that store fuel in bulk or have really complicated permitting around what they do, but it's not primarily what they do. So our classic client would be somebody who has bulk fuel farms in five or six communities in a region in Alaska, and they have to maintain and operate those facilities within all of the environmental permitting that Alaska has. And Alaska is one of the most regulated states in the nation. You may remember something called the Exxon Valdez oil spill that happened in 1989. That happened here. And so when the EPA issued OPA 90 in 1990, the state of Alaska followed that with a series of regulations in 1992 and 1993 that regulate the transportation and storage of fuel heavily. And so we have some of the most restrictive and most complex regulations around storing fuel. And so the ability of the average small to medium-sized business to be able to do that well on their own is limited. And so they bring us in as like experts or to help with the renewal process of some of these permits every five years, because these are thousand page permits. I mean, they're (laughs) they're operating permits. They're essentially legal documents with some spill response stuff tucked inside. And these permits cover everything from like how to respond to a spill to how to maintain your infrastructure and how to have safety measures or precautions in place. So spill prevention in addition to spill response. And so our firm helps with kind of all aspects of that. But we've also, as we've grown larger, we started adding like air and water permitting compliance because, you know, large tank farms have vapors and they emit vapors. They also have stormwater discharges and they also have sometimes uh, APDs or NPDs, water discharges, depending on how old the facility is and what kind of things that they do. We've also taken on other industries like shipbuilding and seafood processing because they're doing one thing, right? Fixing ships, processing seafood, but then they have all these permits and their ability to have an environmental program manager on site that understands all the pieces of it is limited. And so they bring us in as pinch hitters to sort of help them figure out a big problem or get a permit through or understand where they're going wrong with record keeping. So that's what we do in general. A project that we're particularly proud of is we're recently involved in the construction of three new tanks in a community, in a community called North Pole, Alaska. (laughs) No, stop. That's not (laughs) right. It is, yes. (laughs) I'm actually from North Pole. I went to North Pole High School. (laughs) But uh, That's amazing. In, <laughs> I have an in with Santa if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> wink, oh, wink. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so they're constructing, or they just were in the final phases of constructing these three tanks in North Pole, Alaska to support the nearby Air Force Base, Isleson Air Force Base. And we were brought on originally to do the environmental operational permitting that are, is required for a new tank farm. And they're like, just get it all done for us. I'm like, okay. And this project, of course, is like three years in the making. And so when they originally bid it, 
there was suspicion that PFOA PFOS was in the groundwater, but they hadn't necessarily gotten past that. In the three years that this project's been in development and, and gone through, PFOA PFOS has changed from something we should think about to it's definitely a problem to the state changing how they've allowed groundwater that is contaminated with PFOA PFOS to be used drastically. And the state declared a critical water management area in the exact location where this tank farm is. And so that affected a whole lot of the engineering because one, they were relying on groundwater for the firefighting system, which requires like 100,000 gallons within a 10 minute time frame of water <laughs> to fight fires. And it also affected the tank construction because normally when large steel tanks are constructed, and these are 8 million gallon tanks each. So Ooh. They're really large tanks. Yeah. Normally you construct it, you inspect your welds, and then you fill the tank up with water and see how it settles and make sure there's no leaks in the tank. Well, because the PFOA PFOS groundwater was contaminated and there was no other source of 8 million gallons of water, they had to do a different, we had to do an alternate method allowed under the engineering standards. And so we were part of all of that, working with the state, with the PFOA PFOS. I actually brought in experts from Atna about PFOA PFOS who'd been handling everything in Ileson to kind of make sure we what we could and couldn't do because it was developing as we were trying to figure out what to do about it. And then we also worked with the state to allow for that alternate testing of these large welded tanks. And so it was really fun. It kind of got to use all of our experience in one project <laughs> at yeah. a really high level. And then it was kind of exciting to have stuff develop as we were looking at it and, and having to react really quickly. So that tank farm, I think, is one of our cool projects that we've done that I'm prouder of. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought it up because we haven't really talked to like PFOS, PFOA on the show much. But it's absolutely, like you said, it's a rising concern in the environmental field. You just walked us through. They were like, well, it's kind of maybe it's an issue. Oh, no, no, it's absolutely a concern. So can you maybe give us uh, some of our listeners that don't know? what that is, a kind of a brief overview of what it is and sure. why it's so important? I'm not sure I can tell you off the top of my head what all the PFOA PFOS <laughs> initials what it stands stand for. for. Yeah, no, but don't worry about but that. It, I just, yeah. It, it is polyfluoro. It's basically the components of firefighting foam. And mm -hmm. in places that had large military complexes or large airport complexes, they used it for since the 1950s as part of their fire suppression systems. And one of the operational requirements that the fire marshal has had since the 50s is an annual test of the PFOA, PFO, or well, annual test of the firefighting system, the AFFF system, which yeah. usually involved spraying foam all over the runway and then washing it away. So most <laughs> airports and military installations have PFOA, PFOS contaminated groundwater surrounding them. It's something that I think has always been there and has been there since the 50s and 60s, but it's now a concern because it's the molecular construction of PFOA and PFOS is likely to be cancer causing. And the EPA has recognized that and they're being conservative and doing the research now to try to show that it is or is not. And so that's created this very odd space where we don't necessarily have regulations saying that it is cancer causing, but we have a lot of protective stuff right now saying, we think it's going to be, here's how you're going to handle it in the meantime. And some of the very specific issues that we ran into that I thought were probably indicative of things that are going to go maybe in a national bend is with most contaminated groundwater, they allow you to use it for things like construction. If you dewater, if you pull water from a source, as long as you're putting it back to where, you know, sort of like a no harm, no foul rule. If you're pulling groundwater to use for wetting a road in the same area that the groundwater is contaminated, they let you do that. But PFO PFOS is very sticky. It sticks to materials. It sticks to rocks. It sticks to tires. And so they are not allowing that. If you pull PFOA PFOS water for a construction site, you can't use it for dewatering. You can't use it for mixing. And so that is a significant cost issue <laughs> for yeah. a whole lot of people that are doing work in places that have PFOA PFOS groundwater contamination. And for us, that was the, the original plan was to use this large gravel pit pond as the water draw for this AFFF fire system. And that had to be completely reworked. And we ended up building a reservoir and are using potable drinking water from the nearby community, but we have to have a hundred thousand gallon reservoir so we can meet the engineering standards for firefighting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So PFO PFOS, I think is going to have really large impacts to the nation as a whole, because it's going to fundamentally change how construction happens in places that have it much less drinking water and all the, all the other things that go with living in a place like that. Yeah. Wow. I mean, see that brilliant. 
answer. So thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's that's perfect. Hopefully yeah. I got it all right. I'm sure somebody who's a PFO, PFOS expert's like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey. <laughs> But I, no, I would encourage you to go to the EPA's PFO and PFOS page if you have more questions about it. They have a lot of really good material for just the average Joe who wants to know about it. But they also have lots of information for environmental professionals who are interested in learning more about it. And I, I will say, I think this is a really good opportunity because it's going to be a giant problem. And so if you can become an expert in it now, now's the time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, there you go. That's good advice. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of different projects you can be involved in with it. Yes. So thank you for sharing that because it, it was a very clear way of stating what the issue is. And, and interesting because I actually mostly have heard of it from more of the like paving standpoint. I hadn't heard that from like the way you described it. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But now it's time for Field Notes, the part of our show where we ask our guests about memorable moments in the field. And I'm just... Yeah. imagining yeah. you probably have hours worth of yeah. things that have happened in the field in Alaska, especially <laughs> in rural parts. So is there something, one or two things that stands out? Sure. Well, one time we were doing phase one surveys for a micro communications tower company. And it was actually the coolest job of my career because I got flown around in my own personal helicopter to mountaintops all over Kodiak Island. It was amazing. Awesome. Um, <laughs> what? I know it's, it's amazing. Right. But yeah. <laughs> we were doing it in the springtime. And so at one point the helicopter touched down and I was supposed to hop out of the helicopter because it was very windy and he was just going to take off again. And so I hopped out and the sun of course had been hitting the snowpack and it was very icy. And I went and I started <laughs> sliding oh, off gosh. the mountain. And I didn't have a ice pick or anything. And I remember I just dug in my pen and I'm not joking. I dug my pen into the ice and that somehow <laughs> slowed me down enough. Stop. Wow. So I was like, okay, I didn't fall off the mountain. And then the, the helicopter lifted away and I got up very carefully. And then when the helicopter came back, I asked him if he had any ice cleats and he said, he sure did. And I put them on. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> That oh, was one of those I'm having a mini panic like, attack. Okay. I hate, yeah. I don't, I don't ski because I'm afraid of the lift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That one was not maybe my, like I, I, that was one where I was like, I need to be more careful. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh, so smart to use your pen though. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I, I screwed the pen up though. It was not happy. With right. It, but... <laughs> I love that pen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty incredible. But yeah. Do you have, um, you gotta have eagles around there too, right? Do you have anything, uh, Oh, yeah, I do have, <laughs> yeah, I, I do have an Eagle story. <laughs> so <laughs> one of our tank farms is in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and you guys probably are very familiar with that from shows like Deadliest Catch mm -hmm. and Eagles, when they are nesting are viciously protective of their nest. And they sometimes nest in the cliffs around a tank farm in Dutch Harbor. And I came out to do an inspection and I wanted to go to the top of tank four. And they're like, no, nah, no, nope, we can't. Eagles are there. I'm like, well, how bad could it be? I'm like, what are they going to do to me? I got a hard hat on. And they're like, well, take a look at Fred. And, <laughs> and Fred had gone up maybe two, three weeks before me with a hard hat on. And the eagle had dive bombed him, knocked his helmet <laughs> off and scalped him, like grabbed his. Oh, my gosh. Just grabbed his, his hair and just like ripped a chunk of his head off. And he had to go get a bunch of stuff. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm good. I can yeah. see tank mm -hmm. top from here. I don't need to climb up that stairs. So they seasonally close that tank from anything because if you climb up that stairway, the eagles are going to get you. And then <laughs> I went up there with representatives from the USDA to like remove the eagle's nest. And this is something I didn't even know. And where, where I live in Anchorage, there's lots of trees and the eagles build giant nests made out of sticks, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was imagining a nest full of sticks, although I don't know where they would have gotten sticks in Dutch Harbor because there's no trees. But in my mind, I was imagining right. a nest of sticks, right? So we go up, it's well past the mating season and they're like, we'll just remove the nest. And then hopefully the eagles won't come back next year and Fred can climb the tank without any fears. We show up and the nest is nothing but a ring of eagle poop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, we could remove it, but they'll build it back real quick. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So yeah, so the Harbor, the eagles make nests on a bare rock out of their there you own go. poop. Wow. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, what else can you say? That's <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna have, I need a moment here. That's <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Great story. <laughs> I would also would have 
thought sticks. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know. I thought eagles were a little more regal than that, but. <laughs> oh man. I mean, you got to do, gotta do, I guess. No, there's a, there's a, like a secret joke that eagles are basically a vulture with a really good PR agent. That's, that's basically, <laughs> it's a little mean, but that's basically it. Yeah. <laughs> they're really big. I think people, well, I don't know, maybe in the lower 48, they're smaller, but the ones in Alaska are large. Like they're, they yeah. can be like four feet long, just like talon to, to beak tip. And then their wings are pretty wide too. I mean, they're powerful birds, but yeah, they are kind of scavengers. Like they'll, they'll take the path of least resistance every time. Yeah. yeah you guys have those <laughs> instead of uh, seagulls, right? At, at the, oh no, uh, we got those too. You got those too? Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, but they're all at the dump, right? They're all hanging out at the, yeah. the eagles and the seagulls. Yes. Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> like a Tuesday. Good to see you, bud. You know? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, the field work sounds amazing. The work sounds amazing. What are you doing to take care of yourself and in your downtime, what kind of things do you do for fun? I'm an amateur artist. I do a lot of painting and drawing and it's things I can do on the, in the field too. I, I'm a biologist at heart. Obviously I wanted to be that wolf biologist when I first started out. So I am often drawing interesting things. I'm looking and researching about animals. I'm, I'm, I'm new to this summer. I got to go to the Pribilof islands, which are really unique. They're almost like the Galapagos of the North, if you will. They're the mm. fabled sea, uh, fabled fur seal rookeries that the Russians looked for for hundreds of years. And they have really rare seagulls there called red-legged kittiwakes. And they they pretty much only breed there. It's the last population on earth of them. And I just, and they have all these really cool variants of finches and larkspurs that only breed and nest there. So anyway, just a fascinating place to go. And I took my notebook and every day when I was done with the tank farm, I would hop in my little rental vehicle and book it to the seal blinds and sketch seals and paint seals and check out the birds. And anyway, I really like taking what I see and putting it down on paper and just sort of getting the art piece to it. It's one of the things that calms my mind. And I only think about art while I'm doing it. And as a business owner, I'm juggling a million things in addition to the science part of it, right? Like I'm trying to figure out how to make payroll, how to do all these things, how to make sure my HR is on point, you know, like there's all these pieces yeah. to it that have nothing to do with science. And so art kind of feeds that part of my soul that needs to just focus on the amazing beauty that I live in. I am so happy and thankful that I was born and raised in Alaska. It's one of the coolest places on earth and I get to go play in it every single day. And so <laughs> art is sort of like my way of celebrating that. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. It's really, really cool. I love that. And it's, that's why we asked the question, Laura. That's exactly it. Like, I love hearing that answer. Because we all have, we, everybody needs that, right? Everybody needs space and time. To As someone who's, on. someone who's north of 40, I learned the importance of doing and making time for things that are important for your health. Because when you're 20 and 30, you can kind of overshoot the runway a little bit. And then as you get older, <laughs> it starts really, <laughs> it hurts a lot more. And you're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. And in fact, I need to undershoot so that I don't, you know. Like, <laughs> so I would encourage people as they get older to be more conservative and make more time for it because the candle, you can burn at both ends when you're 20. Just it's not burning anymore at 40. And I think wisdom too. Like it's not very really fun to be burnt out. You can do it, but it's not fun, right? It's not how you should live your life for the whole chunk of your life. It should be something that happens and it's an indicator, not, oh, this is how I live all the time. Yeah. And no matter how much we love our jobs, saving the environment, we need to take a break. Mm -hmm. It's just a job. It's not going to show up at your funeral. (laughs) (laughs) You write that down. I'm writing that down. Well, we are close to our time. Can we visit you in Alaska? Nick and I, that is. (laughs) Absolutely. Let me know. I have an itinerary prepared for you. Oh, Kara too. I see Kara raising. I heard you guys yeah, like yes. bears. I heard you guys oh, yeah. like bears on a previous podcast. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. I like it all, all everything. So, um, yeah. yeah. And I'll get, um, I'll get that bomb on my. I don't even have hair for the eagle to scalp, so I'm good. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So, Shannon, the last time I was in Alaska was for our conference, not conference. It was a board meeting in Anchorage. And I have one of my best friends lives in Alaska. So I stayed an extra week and hung out in McCarthy, which was amazing. But you're a member of that that board. Can you tell us about that? How long you've been a member and what you all do up there? Sure. I've been a member, I think, four years now. With COVID, it gets a little fuzzy. I'm not sure I renewed in 2020, but I've, <laughs> I've been a member for about four years. 
And the Alaska chapter of the Association of Environmental Professionals is basically, it's a group of people that get together for brown bag lunches and we sort of share professional resources and networking. And I found it really helpful because I work in this very heavy industrial kind of niche category. We don't do a lot of stuff with NEPA and some of these other things. And so it was kind of nice to just tie into the, the community of environmental professionals as a whole, even though what we're doing is very specific. And so Also, it's allowed me to refer people to other people in our chapter. Like we had a study once that needed an archaeological evaluation as part of it. And I was able to reach out and get somebody through the association to be able to help. I was like, hey, here's somebody that does this. And all I had to do was send an email out to the AEP. And they were like, oh, so-and-so does this, so-and-so does this, and -and so-and-so does this. And I was like, awesome, perfect. That's great. Um, Little stories. Yeah, yeah. So it's just fun networking. And then they have uh, pre-COVID, they would have like annual meetings where we get to meet and greet people. And they always have really, really good speakers. And so I really enjoyed the webinar. Sometimes they would bring in from like people from the lower 48 and it would be this webinar and then we could talk about it afterwards. And that was almost as valuable as listening to the webinar, just hearing all these different ideas and viewpoints about what we had just talked about or listened to. Awesome. Maybe when we visit Nick, we can make it to one of their meetings. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. I'm totally in. Yeah. If they that means wild. I get to hang out in Alaska longer, I'm fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll overshoot the runway together. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> this is when it's okay. This is when it's okay to do that. I haven't hit 40 yet, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I still have time. <laughs> well, so we'll stand on the sidelines and watch you overshoot the runway. Right, right, yeah. Jeez, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about that we didn't get to ask you? I would like to talk about scientific literacy in schools. It's something that I feel like will really help the next generation understand some of the things they're going to have to understand to make good decisions. A lot of environmental regulations are the result of public policy decisions. And I feel like we need more objective and critical readers of scientific reports and news reports and we work really hard. It's one of the things that we we partner with a couple different school districts in Alaska, and we work really hard with, uh, we partner with the science fair, for example, to get kids linked up to professionals in their field that they're interested in. And we work very hard on increasing scientific literacy and understanding how the scientific process works and what a robust science experiment is. I'm sure you guys are aware with kids that there's scientific demonstrations that are called experiments, but they're not actually yes, scientific yes. data gathering yes. uh, <laughs> projects, right? Mm-hmm. And so kids grow up thinking a demonstration is an experiment and they don't actually learn about repetition and repeatability. And so we work really hard from kindergarten on up to have good quality scientific programming in our school so that the kids understand the difference between demonstrations and accurate scientific data and how those come to be. Because I feel like they need to make those decisions for everything from drinking water to how we handle historical contamination to chemicals in the food that we eat. You know, all these things require some basic scientific literacy and whatever we can do to make that stronger and better is really important. So that's my soapbox. All stuff on it. <laughs> no, I, I, I love it. I, I work at the science fair here as well. And I love that, that exact thing and, and giving back. And it's, you know, it's sometimes it's hard because like you, what you do is you say, okay, well, these three projects are really good, but okay. I saw a lot of terrible projects. I saw a lot of stuff that wasn't even a project. It was just like a, I found water outside, you know? And, and so it's, you're right. And, you're and that's right. why we need scientific literacy because their parents and that kid worked so hard on that project thinking mm-hmm. it was real science. And it is, it's the beginning of science, right? But they, right. they don't even realize that it needs four or five more steps before it gets to the point where it would be rigorously tested in the eyes of a science, you know, of a science-based observer. And so we work pretty hard to use the science fair to educate parents and kids, but then we also provide content to schools that ask for it. We also do a lot of stuff with like energy, like how energy gets to your community. So they understand where the power is coming from. Cause for us, it's a barge with fuel on it that delivers fuel. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they don't know that they're like, it comes from the power plant. I'm like, yes, but the power plant has two large tanks full of fuel. And it came to <laughs> the city, city barge. Yeah. So we sort of connect the cycle and make sure they, the kids understand where everything's coming from in their community. Very cool. That's, that's great work. And so if someone wants to get in touch with you, how would you best prefer that? The easiest would be on my LinkedIn account. 
And if you friend me on LinkedIn, you'll get a never ending stream of cool Alaska photos because we've traveled <laughs> quite a bit. I know Laura's seen them already. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been fantastic and can't wait to hang out with you in person. Yeah. Awesome. Anytime for real, I would be happy to host you. (laughs) Sounds great. Now we're in, we're in, I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate the time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming. That's our show. Thank you, Shannon, for joining us today all the way from Alaska and early in the morning. This was super fun and such great conversation. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Bye. See you, everybody.